there next year. I met some of the teachers and was very impressed with their friendliness and their willingness to interrupt classroom procedures so that they could show me around. And I saw the language lab in operation for the first time and was thrilled to see this since we'll have one boy interested in this area. <coughs> And we have again visited the art gallery upstairs, which I feel is an outstanding one and is one of the things I believe that made me very happy to be part of Ball State. Have been in some of the dormitories, especially the one where the freshman students come for their orientation before entering Ball State and over at Neuer, Neuer Hall. And we had a luncheon with the officers of the Student Senate and the officers of the Faculty Senate this noon. You know how the 13-year-olds say the 15-year-old uh, is real cute, the 18-year-old is cool, but the 13-year-old is black. The 15-year-old say the 13-year-old is cute, the 18-year-old is cool, the 15-year-old is black. What boy really is cute? <laughs> I'm going to listen to that answer uh, myself. I think that's a good question. <laughs> I think the 18-year-old is the more social. The 15-year-old uh, has uh, the greatest personality. He's the one we'd call the character. And the youngest one is the one who's the student and the one who's more determined to do exactly what he wants to do, probably, but uh, most often that's what we want him to do, too. And at given times, each of them takes after his mother or his father, depending on the circumstances, you understand. Mm -hmm. Dr. Proust, we'd like to officially welcome you to the Muncie community. Thank you. Have you had an opportunity to look over the city and the university facilities? Well, most of my looking has been in the area of the university, though we have driven around the downtown area just a little bit, and we like what we see. Good. Dr. Proust, we know what the Board of Trustees was looking for in a successor to Dr. Emmons. We would like to know what you asked the Board of Trustees concerning the university and the community before accepting the position? Oh, it's difficult for me to remember specifically, but I'm sure the questions ran something in this direction. What do you people see as the future of the university? That is, what about the educational program? Is it right now where it ought to be 10 or 15 years from now, or will there be opportunities for growth and development? And what answer did you receive? I received the answer that we certainly want to see this institution grow and develop. The particular direction, of course, remains to be determined. This will be up to the faculty, the administrative staff, and obviously the Board of Trustees. Now, Mr. Bracken said that they arrived at the decision. One of the major reasons for the decision was your involvement in community affairs. I believe there was another man who was being considered at the time, but because of your active involvement in community affairs, they thought that you would be the man, the right man for the job. Uh, what part have you taken in community affairs in Kalamazoo? Well, we have tried to serve the community of Kalamazoo in a variety of ways. We have worked with the Community Chest United Fund campaign there. I was given the opportunity to serve as the general chairman for the campaign, and this is a county-wide campaign in Kalamazoo. Obviously, this put us in touch with a good many community leaders. In addition, I have worked with the Kalamazoo chapter of the American Cancer Society, and there have been numerous other organizational problems and organizational groups that we have met with from time to time. Uh, Dr. Proust, I know that this question is coming to mind of many of the alumni, and that is emphasis on sports. What emphasis do you feel should be placed on athletics? Well, it seems to me that athletics is a vital part of any college and university program. I am not thoroughly familiar with the athletic picture here at Ball State, but I can say that we have seen the Ball State Cardinals come to Kalamazoo on occasion for basketball and baseball, 
It seems to me we've also met in swimming, I'm not sure about wrestling and tennis, uh, but over the years Ball State has been known to have a fine program. And always, of course, uh, alumni and students on the campus, as well as I trust community, the citizens right here in Muncie, are interested in having an athletic program that provides excitement, that provides challenge, and uh, from what I can see, it's here now and hopefully will continue on a very sound basis. Dr. Proust, what is the greatest difference between uh, Western Michigan and Ball State University? That's a difficult one for me to answer at this point because you understand I, I know something about Ball State, but I really don't know as much as I would like to know at this point. I think rather than speak of differences, I would like to speak of the similarities because in many ways the institutions are very similar. And this is one of the things that made it attractive for me. It's the kind of institution I have had experience in. It's the kind of institution I have great faith in and I think has a very real job to perform. And therefore, this is a very happy circumstance for me. Dr. Proust, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Yes, in the sense that the major portion of my time for the last year and a half, two years, has been spent on the capital outlay program. Obviously, this requires state support, which would put me in touch with not only the legislature, but the Department of Administration, the Executive Office, Bureau of the Budget. So from time to time, it has been my privilege to meet with legislative committees and individual legislators, yes. The question you asked is one that is frequently asked, and it suggests that somehow there must be uh, a secret, or perhaps putting it differently, uh, somehow it must be a very difficult situation. Now, the way I look at that is this. Every legislature that I know of anyway, and I think this would, uh, could be extended to all of them, has its own problems. They're faced with a number of state agencies, all of which have needs. They're faced with a state budget, which has its own characteristics, and sometimes those characteristics are fairly firm. So the responsibility of the head of any state agency, it seems to me, is to pull his facts together very carefully, very tightly, have a statement of program for his agency, which will set forth the goals, the responsibilities of that agency, and then, of course, to try to translate those into dollar needs. Any budget is a dollar expression of the program of the agency. And legislators are responsible people, and what we seek to do in our work anyway, in Kalamazoo, is to get them to try to understand just what it is we are trying to do and what it will take to enable us to do that job best. Dr. Cruz, your wife mentioned that you had dinner today with some of the student leaders. Uh, what do you see as the role of the student government, since this, you will be dealing with this as president of Ball State, and uh, what do you expect out of them? It seems to me that the role of student government on any campus is defined in terms of past experience on that particular campus. Certainly as a student you realize that the responsibilities which are given and accepted very widely from campus to campus. Students are an important part of the university. Uh, there may be a difference of opinion among the student body, even among the faculty and administrative staff at times on that, but actually when you, when you boil this thing down, everyone will agree that students are an important part of any university. The students, particularly at the college level, are here to gain an education which goes far beyond gathering the given number of quarter hours of credit required for a degree. We would hope that 
all students would be exposed to, have the opportunity to participate in a wide variety of activities beyond the classroom. Now, student government is a natural laboratory for students who are interested in what makes organizations tick. And all we need to do is to find the common ground between us and start working from there. But I don't believe if you're seeking a, a nice formula that would apply a percentage of responsibility for this or that, I don't believe anyone can really give that to you. And certainly I wouldn't try to say that about Ball State because while we had lunch together with five uh, very attractive and very articulate and intelligent young people today, uh, I'm sure I don't know what all of their problems are and, and how they propose to try to solve them. Let me carry the question a little further then. Uh, what do you see, what is your opinion of the so-called social protest movement or the uh, movement of those students who feel that something a little more radical than the conservative student government is in order? Well, here we will speak only briefly and rather generally to this so-called student protest movement as we see it from a rather wide vantage point. I don't know what the situation is here on the campus. I have the feeling that what we have going on today is basically the same kind of thing that occurs from time to time in the history of higher education. The form is a little different today. The form is a little different because of what has been happening in society generally over the past several years, perhaps even since World War II as a, as a taking off point. But a university campus ought to be a place where dissent can take place. This is still not a protective unit of society, but it's one that has an identity all of its own. The confines of the campus still permit us to do some things here that we can't do generally on the outside. So we would encourage always responsible dissent, responsible investigation of problems, and I guess I would have to add that I would hope always that on both sides, or all three sides, or all four sides, however many there are, that we would do this with an air of mutual respect and civility. And if you have that, it seems to me, uh, then we're in business to try to discuss the problems and see how each one would approach them. If it is a student newspaper, by definition, it is a student newspaper. Freedom of the press is a prized possession in our society. And again, I'm assuming with responsible student leadership that uh, no one has to be too concerned about this. if not impossible for me to comment on the specific situation in Indiana because frankly sir I am not familiar with it we find in our state that essentially the state assumes the responsibility for the academic buildings on the campus but places very squarely the responsibility for auxiliary buildings that is auxiliary to the academic program on the students and we have gone into this self-liquidating bonding program just as I know you have here in Indiana. We've also gone into it in I heard that that was uh, something that was about to happen. I would more of the background of that. Uh, I think in my own mind, without knowing that background, I would have to feel generally as an educator that the work of the university results in not only benefit to the student who is here on the campus, but to the state as a whole. 
and that if at all possible there ought to be support from the people of the state as a part of their share in this process. Whether there are some unique problems here that I don't know about, I'm not certain. No, not specifically. We, uh, we find that our three sons are somewhat interested in this new community that uh, is going to be the Proust home. And they're saying, well, when are we going to see it? And all, frankly, all we're able to say at this point, we're going to get you down there quickly, we hope, uh, to have a look-see but uh, we've not scheduled that one. I, I hope it will be soon. The president of Western was asked a question very similar to that by a legislator at a committee hearing last Thursday afternoon in Lansing. And he said, uh, John Proust will be hard at work on June 30. He smiled when he said it, <laughs> because I hope uh, I won't be working on June 30th itself if we're going to start work here July 1st. But again, this is something that has not been ironed out. I do expect to continue through the fiscal year for all practical purposes up there. With the school year just getting underway, as it is on each campus, it seems to me it's a little hard to give a really good answer in terms of what one might expect this particular year. Uh, at the same time, in saying that, I don't see any, any real upswing, uh, though it may be just around the corner. I don't know. I don't have any real feel as to whether or not it might increase or decrease this year. You ask that what type of I had experience with. Uh, if we were to put it in one of those two gap categories, it would be the latter of those two. I think again, each institution develops or perhaps the structure evolves over a period of time in the light of the people who are there and the job that is to be done. Uh, administrative organization charts are rather interesting. I think we need them, uh, need to refer to them even once in a while in addition to having them. But essentially, any organization, whether it be an educational institution or some other type of organization, it seems to me, gets the job done largely in terms of the people who are there and who are ready to address themselves to the problems at hand. Traditionally, uh, Higher education has had the four major areas, academic affairs, student affairs, business affairs, public affairs and development. And this is the type of pattern that I see on paper here and I see it in the people. So it follows very much the traditional pattern. You may or may not know, Ball State's been trying for several years to get a medical school here. Um, are you interested in working toward that goal? Is that uh, uh, part of the things that you see for Ball State? Well, nine months or a little better in advance of the time when I come here to be with you and actually be a part of the organization, I would say this, that the institution is going to develop both horizontally and vertically in directions which are agreed upon by one or two or three things. First of all, 
by the faculty and the students who are here in terms of the people who are here, what their interests are, what their needs are, what people they have who excite ideas about new programs. That's, that's one area. Growth coming out of the people who are here, the people who really are Ball State University. And then there will hopefully be opportunities, growth and development, which will come to the institution by request from the state at, at one level or another. The Board of Trustees, of course, is ultimately responsible for the matter of policy at the university and approval of this kind of thing. Uh, if the state would indicate that there's a very re real need for a particular kind of service and that Ball State University would appear to be the place where this service ought to be provided, then Ball State better be ready to work to provide it. That's what it's here for. The transition or the one of the major problems that would face an administrator in moving from one university to another would be the familiarization of himself with the problems of the new university. Um, what are some of the problems that you see as, as a transition from Western Michigan to Ball State? I see the same problem you do, of getting to know just what this new place is all about, what it's like. And uh, hopefully through perhaps a visit on occasion and certainly quite a bit of reading, in the course of the next nine and a half months, that's exactly what we're going to try to do. And I'm sure the day we come in, we're going to be aware of a brand new problem that we hadn't heard anything about because this is what this business is all about. And if we didn't have those, it would be a static institution and I would want no part of it. I would predict that in my first year, I'm not going to predict this, I would hope that in my first year I would do a lot of looking, a lot of listening, and a lot of learning. And I don't think one moves from this exploratory and gathering of information and insight stage dramatically, either up or down, into a program of instituting change. The day when the president of an institution, the size, complexity of Ball State, the day when such a president feels that he is going to come in and create his institution is long gone. As a matter of fact, for an institution of this size, I really don't believe it ever was there. Sometimes we hear of institutions being the shadow of a man. And this is always meant to be a very fine compliment to a president. Ordinarily, this is spoken of uh, presidents of the smaller institutions, who gentlemen who have been on the scene for a long, long time, and in many ways, uh, they have become, perhaps, the shadow of the man. That is, his, his influence has been so dramatic on the institution that you can see it everywhere. And all I'm saying is, is that when you get to a school that has a number of colleges, it goes into professional programs, it has a wide staff in a number of different areas. No one man at this stage of the game can place his indelible imprint on that institution all by himself. What we will seek to do is to come in as the head of this team of supporting staff to try to work with the students, the faculty, the board of trustees, to develop the conditions which will allow the essential purpose of this institution to take place, and that is education of young people, older people, programs of research, undoubtedly, public service, absolutely. But it, it's not going to be Proust University. Well, Dr. Proust, um, the, the trend seems to be in my mind. Uh, in effect, correct me if I'm wrong, but I interpret uh, this as to some degree what you're saying that you feel here. Uh, am I right or wrong? Because what you're 
Well, if you and I both mean the same thing by decentralization, yes. In other words, in other words where it would not necessarily be determined by a college president or a college president and say four or five people. Yes, may, may I give an example that may not fit the situation exactly, and it grows out of my own experience at Western in recent years. We happen to have an Army ROTC program on the campus. And uh, when a young man completes his degree and his papers are being sent in for his commission, that form calls for certification by the PMS, Professor of Military Science, and the certifying official of the university that the young man has completed his work. Well, there was a, for a long time, these were signed personally by the president. And typically, there are two or three copies of each, and if you have a sizable ROTC unit, it means the president signs his name many times on that set of forms, as well as many others, of course. Well, for a long time, it was signed by President Miller and President Sangren before him. That is no longer the case. I've been signing them most recently. And uh, were I to continue in that group to grow any more than they had, I think we'd get it down into the registrar's lab or something of that sort. Now, this is a pretty simple example to throw your way. But again, the, uh, the experience in the smaller institution is that the president can be and should be very, very close to many of the day-to-day -day administrative details. Well, the president of an institution the size of Ball State simply cannot stay immediately on top of this wide variety. What he needs is a staff of very good people working with him who see to it that the policies, which are the Board of Trustees policies, or agreed administrative policies, which have been delegated, that these are being carried out. Now, let me hasten to say the President needs to be informed about all of these. I don't mean to suggest that the President turns over to the staff the problems of running the university. Eventually, of course, he is responsible to see to it that what is happening is in line with the policies of the Board of Trustees. But all I'm saying is he can't possibly do each one of these himself. So decentralization in that sense, yes, in that he's getting assistance, you see, and advice and guidance from a strong supporting staff. Dr. Bruce, in connection with uh, Tom mentioned student government, I really don't feel uh, close enough to that problem to to suggest that I have an answer. I don't I don't know that it uh, that at this stage of the game I uh, know enough about that one. If this is what the students want, I would assume that they would uh, would provide it. I don't know. Not only decentralization, but the depersonalization and the large classes, the uh, uh, feeling that perhaps they are a number instead of a, of a name and that they have no real place as a person in the university. Uh, what do you think about this? I think it's a regrettable circumstance if that is indeed the case. Uh, <coughs> let me say two or three things. I think I'll end up with two or three before I'm through on this because it's pretty complicated. I think it's perfectly possible for a student to feel that he is just uh, an anonymous something out here in a small institution. I don't think identity or anonymity is simply a function of size. I think there are families of four and five, maybe even, th maybe even two people. Maybe a husband-wife combination can really be a pretty anonymous situation. And yet a large family might be one where there's very close identity. So in, in an institution, I, I think it's the tendency for most of us in America who have been alerted to the concepts of the mass 
in recent years, and goodness knows we have it in many areas. I think it's our tendency to think immediately, if you get large, you lose something. Now, I would agree that it's easier to lose your identity in a large group. And as this institution grows and grows in size, the ease for a student to get lost is going to increase. There's no doubt about that. But I don't believe it has to happen. There are some institutions in this country, fairly large institutions, which have been known within the fraternity, you might say, as being friendly institutions, where faculty do indeed take an interest in students, where a student can actually get to a faculty member uh, at odd moments, uh, not necessarily just during the one hour a day that's posted on his office door, something of that sort. That, I think, is the kind of place Ball State is, and believe me, if it is, we all have to work like the Dickens to keep it that way. One of the things that impressed Mrs. Proust and me when we visited this campus the very first time was that as we walked into the student center, there were students who, in going through the door ahead of us, took the time to make sure that we didn't get our fingers caught in the doors that closed. There were students who said good morning, and they didn't know who we were from anybody. Uh, we found this uh, among faculty and other members of the supporting staff. The Muncie Press quoted me very correctly in saying that one of our very happy uh, experiences on this campus, the first time we sneaked in, was when my car went dead, and incidentally it was on uh, University, not on Riverside, I happened to be close to traffic and safety. It walked up uh, just another guy, but here was a man who saw another human being who had a problem late Saturday afternoon, and he was disturbed because it had happened a couple of months before, and his good people back in Kalamazoo said it was all fixed.